it for this episode. Epic. This entire episode was epic. Hey guys, Shalana here. Welcome to The Ben Zone. On today's video, we're talking about Lovecraft Country episode 7 titled I Am. And there's a lot to get into because there's so much things that happen. Hypnotic comes from out of nowhere to become one of, if not my favorite character in this entire show. But before we dive too deep into this, guys, if you guys are new here, hit that subscribe button, give this video a thumbs up. Follow my podcast, The Magical Negro Podcast, in the description box below where I break down this episode with further detail and really get into the nook and cranny of Lovecraft as a whole. Also, guys, I have shirts. Guys, we have shirts. We have Lovecraft Country shirts. So definitely check that description box below. But with that being said, let's dive into this episode because there's a lot to cover. Now, this episode starts off in Hippolytus trying to figure out how to open the Ori. Now, Hippolytus using algebra, physics, cartography, and I'm looking at Hippolyta trying to break down the code, and I'm like, yo, Hippolyta is the smartest character in this show. There were hints of it sprinkled out throughout the previous episodes, but now we're seeing her in action, and she knows all these different types of sciences and studies to try to open this Ori. We then flash back to three days ago, and Hippolyta found the Braithwaite Mansion in ruin, and she finds the picture that Dee gave George, and she realizes that Tick and Letty and Montrose are lying to her. When we flash back to her room, as she's figured out how to open the Ori, she uses physics and the science of rotation and the rotational gravitational pulls of the sun to figure out how to open it. And the Ori opens up and she finds the key to the time machine and it reads this. Every beginning is in time and every limit of extension in space. So this quote is setting up the episode and setting up Hippolyta's character to let us know that Hippolyta is being confounded by society and the structures of not just society, but the structures of the fabrics of the universe, and she has more grandiose plans. This is dope. This is super dope because Hippolyta herself is what you'd call a middle-aged woman in her 40s, probably 50s, right? Because usually in sci-fi, the main protagonists are usually young and white. Think Star Wars, Star Trek, etc., right? And then you start to devolve into young black and other minorities, but it's never a middle-aged black woman, and this is showing us that, yo, even though Hippolyta's older and she's on the older end compared to the main characters, sci-fi in itself and adventure is not limited by age or by gender. Sci-fi is science fiction. The limits and fabrications of our imagination are not limited to our age, demographic, or anything. Hippolyta can be greater than what it is. Then switch to Ruby and Christina, and Christina shows Ruby what's in the basement. And a lot of people called it in the comment section below. It is the bodies of William and Dell, and she is bloodletting them, essentially taking their blood to create this potion that allows you to transform into them because both of them are dead. But instead of letting their bodies go to waste, she's preserving their bodies and having them pump out blood for her spell. And we get a little backstory on Christina. We come to learn that Christina is trying to do exactly what I said a few videos ago. She's trying to learn all the magic in the world to become all powerful because initially, Christina just wanted to prove her dad wrong and prove that boys are not the only ones that are allowed to have magic. Girls can have it too. But then her dream got bigger and the scope of it got bigger. William was a lover of hers who taught her magic and when William died, she wanted revenge. So at this point, Christina has grandiose plans for herself and she lets Ruby in by telling Ruby everything that Ruby needs to know. At this point, I'm 100% sure Christina's not telling Ruby the truth because why would she? I mean, if she spins Ruby a lie and has Ruby working for her, she doesn't have to share that power because I don't see Christina wanting to share that power with Ruby. I mean, why? Like, why would she even give Ruby the satisfaction or the time of day to share this power when Christina herself can be almighty and can be the all mother of everything. After Christina and Ruby scene, we switch to Letty who's having the same dream as Atticus and Hannah's leading her out of the house. Before she steps out, she rubs her stomach and oh my God, Letty is pregnant with Atticus's kid. This opens up so many different possibilities because at this point, Letty is seeing Hannah and she's only seeing Hannah because she has Hannah's blood flowing through her. While she's not a descendant of Hannah per se, the fact that she's carrying Hannah's descendant, she's carrying Atticus's kid, because at this point in gestation, Letty has Atticus's unborn son in her. So now her blood has Braithwaite in it because she's carrying Atticus's child. So because Letty has this, Letty has a whole new world open to her because now she can actually use magic and she is able to tap into the magical side 
of Atticus's lineage because she's carrying his child. And then I mentioned she's carrying Atticus's child? This is a lot. This is a lot. The show just took a crazy spin. Last episode, we're focused on Atticus's previous lover. And now his current lover is now carrying his child. And this means a lot because this whole show is about legacy. And now Atticus's legacy is being built as the show goes on. It's going to be passed down to him and Letty's child. At this point, I have a theory about time travel and Letty's child. But for me to get deeper into that, check out my podcast, The Magical Negro Podcast. Because I really break down the intricacies of Atticus and Letty's child and what that could mean for the future of this episode because as at the end of this episode we see that Atticus has Lovecraft Country the actual book and that means the show went meta and now that they have the book that dictates how the story will play we know with the book it causes a causal loop or the grandfather paradox and that creates a whole new dynamic in which the chain of events that are happening cause a causal loop in time which I get into really in the podcast because it's too heavy to get into the, in this video so definitely check that out but moving on from that Atticus and Letty are trying to figure out what's going on and they're trying to understand how they can get a step up on Christina and Atticus and Letty realize they share the same dream, the dream by Hannah and Hannah has the book of names and the book of names is Titus Braithwaite's book in which it has all the spells. While Christina's trying to find the pages here and there, you know, small fry stuff, Letty and Atticus have access or the potential to have the entire book and be masters of magic themselves. So finally, they're gonna get a heads up on Christina and they're gonna be one step ahead of her. That is a big leg up they're gonna have. So they go to Montrose to find out if Montrose knows how to get in contact with Atticus's mother's family. But at this point, Montrose is free. He's living with Sammy. Montrose woke up, his bae is making him breakfast. He's living the life, even though he's still being Montrose and he's still a nigga. And I'm not gonna complain because Montrose is still my favorite character. But the fact that he's giving Sammy shit for actually looking out for him. And then when Sammy storms off, Montrose actually chases his mad, and I'm sitting here like, oh, so Montrose is out, out. And then Montrose gets caught by Atticus and Letty, and the whole situation blows up. Because at this point, Tick sees that Tree was telling the truth, and Tick is pissed, because his dad is, I'm not gonna say the word, at this point, Tick calls his father out of his name, and they get into an altercation. Montrose takes off his shirt, ready to fight Tick. And I'm like, bruh, you don't remember two episodes ago when Tick beat your ass? Like, I know you're his dad, but calm down. Tick is taller, stronger, faster, more skilled than you chill, bro. But you can understand because Montrose finally is living his life and his son catches him and his son degrades him. We talked about this in previous videos, how he was in the closet for the sole reason and now that he's trying to be out, his son actually checks him. It's a lot. But Tick doesn't check him because of that. We find out that Tick was getting beat by his father because his father wanted to make him tough and strong and not a sissy. And in that way, Tick thought it was always out of love. But at this point, it's not out of love. It's because Montrose is projecting onto Tick. Because Montrose doesn't want his son to be weak or a sissy or like him. And because he can't beat it out of himself. He wants to beat it out of Tick from Tick ever becoming like he is. And it's trauma upon trauma. Tick is getting traumatized by his father who got traumatized by his father and Tick this whole time didn't hold it against Montrose because he thought that was his father's own demented way of showing love but that was just Montrose's self-hate being externalized and it's like bruh. Tick was hurt not because of what his father is or what his father's orientation is but more so because his father instead of being open with him treated him like a pariah and passed out all his hurt and pain onto Tick. Man, that's a lot of trauma and healing that Tick needs to do. At this point, Hippolyte decides to take Woody and go to the coordinates in which he's gonna use the, use the time machine to travel. Tick goes to St. Louis to meet his family and Letty and Ruby start to bond. Both of them are trying to open up while both of them keeping secrets from one another. Letty's still keeping her same secret while Ruby's keeping the fact that she's in on it with Christina and knows and she's now spying on Letty. So at this point, it's like Christina and Ruby are working together against Atticus and Letty. When Tick gets to his family, he finds out that they don't have the book of names, but he has a birthmark that's passed down from family to family that ties them to magic. Then we switch to Hippolyta who gets to the observatory and she figures out how to use the time machine because Hippolyta is sitting there, calculations flying, pulling out her notepad, breaking down physics, 
coming up with a formula to space and time? Do you understand how much of a genius you have to be to come up with a formula to master space and time? She does this, the time machine starts to work, and of course, this would not be Lovecraft Country if some white racist cops did not show up to fuck shit up. And they show up, but before they can terrorize Hippolyta, Tick gets there just in time, fights them, they shoot the machine, they mess it up, Tick throws a cop in the infinite void of time, and then they both, Tick and Hippolyta get sucked into this wormhole, and Hippolyta ends up in the future. And she's met by this Afro-futurist goddess, and I'm sitting here like, Afro-futurist goddess. I believe. This is amazing because this is a mainstream show showing Afrofuturism. And Hippolyta starts to understand what she is. She, she's in the future and she's decoding and hot wiring the room until this Afrofuturist goddess comes in and asks her who she is, say her name, what does she want. And Hippolyta says she wants to go dancing with Josephine Baker and is teleported there. Now, throughout the show, we see every time Hippolyta is somewhere through time and space, we see coordinates in the bottom of the screen. Those coordinates, to me, represent moments in time because time and space at this point were operating on a fourth dimensional level in which you can go from here to here you can go from moment to moment so those coordinates are not locations per se but moments in time that you can travel through and she's with josephine baker now this is probably because josephine baker was a prominent african-american woman that was active between the 30s and the 60s and josephine baker decided to move to paris and forgo her american ideology and her American citizenship to become a citizen of Paris because she refused to perform in front of segregated audiences in America. She was able to unshackle herself from the confounds of the American oppressive system and she was able to find freedom in Paris. So at this point, Hippolyta is finding freedom in Paris and we see that Hippolyta is starting to strip away all the baggage that she carried because earlier, before she was transported through space and time, she woke up naked. Now, her waking up naked is symbolism at its finest. It shows that Hippolyta had all this baggage because Hippolyta initially looked on the more heavier side as a woman with her clothes on. When you see her completely naked, she's lighter, she's smaller. And I'm not saying this to judge body types. I mean that it's symbolizing Hippolyta shedding all that heavy clothes, all the burden of society, and she's actually embracing who she is and her self and her femininity. She's actually stripping out everything that stopped her from being Hippolyta, and that's the message of this episode. So as she dances with Josephine Baker, and then she's transported to a different time period, and in this time period, she's surrounded by the Homi Warriors. Now, the Homi Warriors are a tribe of Western African warrior women Amazon. They were a real thing in history. They happened during the 17th, 18th century, and they were fierce warriors for the most part that had never been defeated and was able to protect their land and their people, and they were all compromised of women. Now this scene is showing us that the name Hippolyta doesn't just come from one woman and the white Greek Amazons, but we also had black Amazons and the homie warriors represent that Hippolyta became their leader. So she's embracing the name Hippolyta, similar to the Wonder Woman name, but she's taking it and making her own by becoming her own Amazonist warrior. And that scene shows that everything that they say black women are not, or everything that I say black women are, are strengths. They're not weak because of these things, they're strong because of it, and we see them fight a wave of warriors, and they beat the ass, straight up. Hippolyta and her girls whoop ass, and she lets them know that we are women, we can do this too, and she is Hippolyta, and she's then transported, and we finally see Uncle George. Uncle George is back, guys, Uncle George is back. I was, I was happy as shit. Even though I, we're not sure that if that's our Uncle George or if that's an Uncle George from an alternate timeline, it's still good to see Uncle George nonetheless. Now, Hippolyta is explaining to Uncle George about the many worlds theory, time travel, and the many worlds theory is a theory in which multiple realities and multiple universes happen at the same time. Think of the multiverse, and in every reality, there's a different possibility, and in this reality, George is not dead, and Hippolyta is able to traverse into that. And we get into more details about just how that happens. The key thing here is Hippolyta not only figured out multidimensional travel, but she also figured out that George was a contributing factor to her and her baggage because she felt so small. She felt like she was being shrunk and that's because society boxed her in. She said this when she was talking to Josephine Baker and it's, she hates the confounds of society. She hates how because who she is, she was had to shrink down. 
As a child, she discovered a comet and she named it, but society and the machinations of racism stripped that away from her. And she's confounded into this small space and she really hates that. And she hates white people for what they've done and their institutionalized racism and how they box in a black woman. And because George saw her curiosity, George fell in love with her. But George too also benefited from that. And that's why a lot of people say black men treat women like white men treat black people. Because black men demoralize black women and diminish them in order to live out their dreams. George was out there living out his dreams while making sure he had to stay home and he always had a rock to get back to. But once they're able to forgive each other and move on, they go into the future and they start this magical botany class or whatever. But Hippolyta ends up figuring out a way of what she needs to do and she contacts the Afrofuturist goddess and they meet in this nebula nexus of space and time. And my mind is blown because the effects of this episode are so movie-like and the fact that we're seeing Hippolyta in the grandiose cosmos of space with an Afrofuturist goddess, that's a lot of moving things happening. And as this is happening, Hippolyta is discovering who she is and her powers. And she has a choice. She can actually become this fourth dimensional God being, traversing all realities and becoming who she's meant to be. Or she can go back to her daughter. And Hippolyta takes one for the team and decides that her daughter, D, needs her. And a mother's love is so powerful because Hippolyta has everything she's ever wanted and she's giving that up to go be with D. And I don't look at that as being negative. I look at that as Hippolyta is a mother. It's her choice to protect D, right? Hippolyta's biggest issue is that throughout her entire life, she never had a choice of being who she wanted to be. But in this episode, in this moment, she was given a choice and she chose her daughter. That's not her limitation. That's not her limiting herself, but that's her exercising what she always wanted, choice. She can be an interdimensional goddess fighting through space and time, or she can be a mother. So she chose to be a mother. If Hippolyta was supposed to become a multidimensional god with no other choice, I don't think she'd want that because she doesn't want what she can't have. She wants the choice to be able to choose and giving her that choice and her choosing her daughter was so powerful. But that's when we find out that Hippolyta did not appear yet. It's Tick that shows up through the portal and he has the Lovecraft Country book. And I'm sitting here like, holy shit, this show just went full meta. If he has the book, he knows how the story ends. But if he finds out how the story ends by him reading the book, is that what causes the story to end the way it does? And the whole time thing starts to happen again. And I really get into this. I really want to get into this even deeper with you guys. But there's not enough time on a YouTube video. So definitely check out the podcast, the Magical Negro podcast in the description box below. But anyway, guys, that's my thoughts on this week's episode. There's so much more I want to unpack here, but there's not enough time in a YouTube video. You know how YouTube algorithm is. I have to keep the video short, sweet, and to the point. So definitely check out the podcast. Definitely hit the thumbs up. Hit the subscribe button, guys. Follow me on Twitter, Instagram, at the Ben Zone. And guys, until next time, binge on.